Yeah. Radio Free ends with episode 287, everybody. That's pretty dank if I do say so myself. But you know what's not so dank? Retro death. At least as it exists nowadays. We're talking about death metal that's self-consciously trying to pick up on the early 90s old school death metal style. And yeah, nowadays it's gotten kind of boring for the most part. But it wasn't always like this. You see, during the halcyon days of the old school death metal revival movement, which I would place uh, mid 2000s to 2012-ish, there was actually a whole lot of good stuff being put out. And in this modern age of your frozen souls and your mammoth grinders and your gate creepers, it seems like a lot of the really good stuff from that time period specifically has been forgotten about. So to ameliorate this embarrassing situation, I have elected to display to you two bands from that time period that I see as being somewhat connected. We're talking about Blasphirian from Texas and Dizma from New Jersey. Now these two bands don't sound exactly alike and they don't actually share any band members, but there are a lot of very interesting similarities between the two that will become clear to you over the course of this episode. For instance, both of these bands are sort of weird amalgamations of newer death metal people and returning old school veterans, sort of Frankenstein together. Body parts and dumpsters all around the city, long story short, is put back together by science, or maybe it's supernatural. The old school component of Blasphirian's deathly assemblage comes in the form of highly underrated guitarist Wes Weaver, who most of you should remember from the great band Imprecation. Wait, you don't know the band Imprecation? Oh, lovely. They've sent me a moron! Nah, I'm just yanking your chain. A lot of people don't know imprecation. Who are not? A stereotypical Asian man's attempt to say the word implication. You cannot go on or keep ringing my bell! You disturb me! And they're also not really meant to be the focus of this episode, so I don't want to go too deep on them. Just know that they're a really dark sort of mixture of black metal and death metal from the early 90s in Texas that wrote songs titled stuff like Vomit of Christian Remains And of course that sounded a little something like... Some sort of weird halfway point between Demon Sea and Morpheus Descends, with an exceptionally brutal guitar tone. It combined the Gorsuk savagery of death metal with the sepulchral atmosphere of black metal. And honestly, I really feel like they should be up there with the other bands that end in Asian. You know, your suffocation, incantation, immolations. Maybe it's just because they're from Texas. Holy dog shit, Texas! Or more likely, it's because they pulled an arch goat and only put out seven inches and in demos back in the 90s. Whatever the case, guitarist Wes Weaver decided to gather together some other death metal folks, new and old, in the mid-aughts, and put together the new band Blasphirian, who crashed onto the scene with their 2007 EP, Allegiance to the Will of Damnation. And much like Imprecation, it had just as much in common with black metal as it did with death metal, although they went for a slightly more crushing approach in this iteration of that sound, with a heavy emphasis on mid-paced grooves to offset the blasting. They were also rather fond of really examining every possible version of that riff by changing up the drum beats under it. The most important difference between Blasphirian and Imprecation is Blasphirian's fondness for almost sort of doom metal sections, such as the one you're hearing right now, which even includes some rather candle mass-esque utilization of the harmonic minor scale. One might also draw a comparison to Therian back when they were a really dark death metal band instead of a goofy power metal band. But now we're getting up to another really good example of them fully exploring the ideas behind each riff. As the drum beat shifts to where the snares and the cymbals are basically doing the same thing, but his feet are going all double bass, changing it from those doom metal hammer blows into a solid shuddering wall of noise, in tandem with the guitars changing their approach to be more tremolo pick. Before returning back to the realms of doom metal, these guys are really good at writing songs that flow very naturally, with each part going smoothly into the next, at least until they don't because they are also fond of sudden reversals and inversions in their songwriting. Which, I mean, you gotta expect. The album cover's got this 
demon brandishing a enormous inverted cross. Similarly to Blasphirian, Dizma were an odd amalgamation of death metal old heads and newer folks, demonstrating why, at least in the case of death metal, it will often serve you well to respect your elders. You'll slam your head so far down between your shoulder blades, you'll have to open that vest to bait your own anguish as I hold a mirror up to your midsection, yeah! Because in this case, the old school component comes from a member of a different Asian band, that being Craig Pillard, the vocalist on Incantations, Onward to Golgotha, Mortal Throne of Nazarene, and Forsaken Morning of Angelic Anguish. Legendarily brutal vocalist. One of the first really sick sounding ones in death metal, if you ask me. But whereas with Blasphirian, you could kind of see them jumping off of Wes Weaver's prior band's imprecation sound, Dizma doesn't sound like Incantation with Craig Pillard back on vocals. Now, if you want that, just go listen to Disciples of Mockery. Now, Dizma were actually surprisingly European sounding, at least to my ears, on their debut EP, which also came out in the mid 2000s. In fact, a lot of this album sounds very much like an expansion of the old school Finnish death metal sound, which makes a whole lot of sense given that the other guys in this band besides Craig played in Funebrarum, which were 100% a Finnish death metal tribute act from New Jersey. One similarity they do have with Les Fearing is their fondness for playing the same riff with different drum beats under it, like right here. But then they jump into this total, almost Swedish sounding D-beat death metal riff. I mean, they even got the chainsaw, unlike a lot of those Swedish death metal bands, they're really good at writing these nasty fucking groove riffs. Also a whole lot of autopsy going on in this band's sound, which is never a bad thing when you're doing this kind of death metal. It helps when you can write really catchy riffs like this one, really taking advantage of how brutal that guitar sound is. Another slight parallel to Blasphirian would be Dizma's incorporation of rather doom metal-ish sounding riffs. That said, they're a different sort of doom riff than what you would hear in Blasphirian. Blasphirian was a little bit more atmospheric and evil in their focus. Dizma is way more percussive and going for the jugular with this shit. They also incorporate a whole lot of very Finnish sounding lead melodic guitar lines over the top of the chugging. Like honestly, this sounds like it could have happened on the first sentenced album. But where Blasphirian were all about those smoothly flowing compositions with only occasional inversions, Dizma tends to have way more change up to their sound. A whole lot of riffs in different sections of the song. Like in a six minute long song, they'll have at least three regular songs worth of riffs going on. And they'll jump back and forth between autopsy style stuff, Finnish style stuff, and Swedish style stuff multiple times in each composition. Speaking of jumping, let's jump back into Blasphirian real quick. Because in 2011, they put out a full length entitled Infernal Warriors of Death that has a really cool album cover. Which, yeah, it has some obvious references to Immolation's first album, Dawn of Possession. But something about the color scheme and the way the trees look on it always reminded me of the Dark World and Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo. Well, excuse me, princess. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I think it's a cool aesthetic. I actually used to have a shirt of this album cover, but it got holes in it. <laughs> And let me tell you, when this album came out, I was already a huge fan of the band. That's why I pre-ordered it to get the shirt. But this full length blew my fucking mind. The sound of the album very much fits the album cover. It's a lot more colorful, if that makes sense. You got all those browns and oranges, reds, yellows, and purples compared to the black and white of the EP. And similarly, the guitar sound just seems less monochromatic on the full-length album release. I really dig it. I'm aware that there's a sizable contingent of people that prefer the EP to the album. I gotta say, I'm not one of them. Speaking of that sense of color, this album has a little bit more sort of melody to it as you're hearing right now. Fits in well with those dark flowing compositions from the EP, until it doesn't. Because just like the EP, they're big on those death metal style change-it-ups utilized in this sort of black metal context. And yet it never seems like fully random or janky. Like this riff right here, it's actually a very logical counterpoint riff to that melody that opened the song up. Jump into another transition right here that demonstrates something else. You know, when this album came out, a lot of people were comparing it to Immolation. And while I think a bit of that comes from the fact that the album cover is very Immolation looking, when you're hitting the artificial harmonics and the weird dissonant melodies like this, yeah, no, definitely up there with the best in early Immolation. In fact, as much as I enjoy Immolation, I like this album a whole lot more than what Immolation was doing at the time. Take care, Monitor. 
what you say is heresy. Look, man, I'm just saying, if you're one of these people out there, your favorite Immolation albums are Here and After and Dawn of Possession, you really ought to give Blasphirian's Infernal Warriors a death a shot. I'm a real big fan of these evil sort of blast beat waltz riffs. They're falling over on top of each other like a mound of corpses rolling down a hill before the riffs dramatically straighten themselves out with a very nasty bit of subterranean death metal groove. I don't know if it's the production or what, but for some reason the groove riffs on this album hit me a lot harder than they did on the EP. Moving on into another one of those, is it black metal, is it death metal kind of riffs? Honestly, it's sort of both. It's, uh, it's good metal, that's what it is. Maybe a little bit of very early death metal era dark thrown in there. And it bridges perfectly into my favorite riff of the album, wherein they expand upon the doom metal leanings of that EP they put out with some utterly dismal, nihilistic sounding stuff. I mean, this riff even has nihilism built into its resolution. Watch this. That's how the musical phrase ends that we're trailing off into nothingness of an ultra-primitive two-note string bend. Here it comes again, dude. I think the fact that that sort of utterly dismal doom death rip coexists on the album with all the fast stuff is a big part of the appeal of this release. Certainly more interesting than if it was just all fast or all slow. Compositional dynamics. What are you doing using your big school words? Just use normal people words and I'll understand what you're talking about. In another notably striking parallel, Dizma also put out their full-length album in 2011, which also had a really cool fucking cover. Actually, it was like a really big digipack that folded out on both sides, showing off this weird panorama. And like Infernal Warriors of Death, Towards the Megalith reminded me of a video game. Although in this case, gotta be those hollow levels from Gears of War 2. Something about the fungus and the tree roots and the rocks, I don't know. And as was the case with Blasphirian, there is a rather vocal contingent of people that massively prefer the EP over the full-length album. But in this case, I can kind of more see where they're coming from. Mainly comes down to the guitar sound. It's real easy to pick up the difference between the two because they actually re-recorded every song from the EP for the LP. The EP was big on that Finno-Swedish sort of chainsaw guitar. Whereas the LP is considerably more polished sounding. Not bad, just cleaner. This is most noticeable in the more groove-oriented sections. This is the EP and the guitar is really kind of snap. Whereas on the LP, they're a little more lumbering sounding. And I could see if you were really big on that sort of Finnish Swedish style they were running with on the EP, why you might be disappointed. I kind of like the more lumbering approach though. It sounds like a fucking rhinoceros. Say your prayers, titles. Either way, this album's got three re-recordings and then five new ones. And wouldn't you know it, uh, the new songs are great too. Actually shows off them expanding their sound a little bit. As was the case with Blasphirian on the full length, the sound is considerably more colorful this time around to match the album art. But it's still primarily based upon minor variations of riff sequences that abruptly transition into startling change-ups that still echo elements from earlier in the song. For instance, this blast beat section's main riff certainly retains elements of the initial melody that opened up the song. And like their earlier material, it's still startlingly European sounding, particularly in its usage of D-beats, which weren't really a big part of American death metal outside of Master. And here's some more of that autopsy style lead guitar melody working its way around that devil's tritone before dropping into this nasty fucking breakdown riff, which in turn will show off another major new aspect of this band's sound, that being their usage of some very clever rhythm variation. Look at those full stops right there. Then proceeding to jump into this almost horror movie theme melody type of thing. Suitably creepy. And the new production style really shows off the string bends and lends a lot of percussive weight to the fuzz. And of course some cool overlaid harmonies. When this album came out, it uh, did not leave the CD player, my old Mitsubishi clips, for quite a while. So you might be wondering, how come people don't talk about these bands anymore? I mean, both of those albums sounded pretty fucking good to me. I mean, it's easy to blame the metal scene for being a bunch of- Flat out fucking poo! And that's probably a big part of it, but both of these bands ran into fairly major roadblocks in the years following the release of both of their respective debut full lengths. In the case of Blasphirian, Imprecation actually came back with an entirely new lineup apart from the vocalist, no Wes Weaver. And actually, the uh, newly reformed Imprecation has not only released way more music since their reunion than they ever did in the 90s, but they've also attracted the attention and participation of a lot of other more old school metal people, namely Mike Hernandez 
Hernandez from Thorn Spawn doing some guitar work for them, and Jeff Tandy from one of my personal favorite bands, Averse Sephira, playing bass. Not that there appears to be any bad blood between Blasphirian and the newly reformed Imprecation. They even did a split 7-inch at one point. But Blasphirian has kind of been put on hold in limbo, pretty much broken up since Wes Weaver, who I believe was the main guy behind the band, died in 2021. Meanwhile, Dizma, nobody in that band died, or had like weird resurrections of older bands. Instead, after being a critical darling for a while, they actually ran into the silk-gloved fists of modern-day cancel culture, namely in the form of uh, award-winning journalists such as Kim Kelly and Axel Rosenberg. There are more Nobel Prize winners in the San Francisco Bay Area than anywhere on the planet. Nobel Prize for what? Back in fudge? Specifically in reference to vocalist and sort of band leader Craig Pillard, who in addition to being an incantation prior to Dizma, was involved in a whole lot of projects. He did some bass work with Ceremonium, he did guitars and vocals on that Disciples of Mockery album, played bass for Evokin, but more importantly, for the case of uh, Pearl Clutching Hipsters, he had a Marshall Industrial project called Sturmfuhrer that put a couple albums out on Elegy Records way back in the day. Now Marshall Industrial, not really my thing. Uh, I guess Storm Fuhrer is alright. I liked it more than Blood Axis, less than Cruzweg Ost, but I'm probably not the best judge of the genre. However, around 2015, 16, 17-ish, uh, people were really interested in canceling Elegy Records. And when they found out that the Dizma guy was putting out some uh, ideologically questionable stuff, at least in their eyes, on that label, he got caught up in all that firestorm and the Dizma got dropped from their label and People started protesting their shows, all kinds of shit. For most people, that sort of thing would be a band ender. And indeed, both of the Funebrarum guys jumped ship from Dizma around this time. But luckily for the Dizma fans, Craig kept Dizma going. Got a new drummer, the guy from uh, Abba Zagarath, a foundational New Jersey black metal band. He even started playing guitar himself. And in 2022, he got the band signed to Necroharmonic and finally managed to get out a follow-up EP to Towards the Megalith. And let me tell you, if if you're an old Disney fan and you didn't know this came out, you've been missing out. Because this one's a banger. When you first put it on, it's like Disney never left. It sounds just like the album did. That weird cavernous mid-paced sort of shit totally slays all of the more PC cavern core bands that got so trendy towards the end of the 2010s decade. But as you venture further into it, you'll start to notice their sound has evolved a little bit. A little bit less finish, a lot more weird autopsy-esque psychedelia. That said, there's still plenty of old school Finnish Doom Death style riffs going on here. But that same shuddering wall of distortion that's always distinguished this one. It's really mostly in the slower moments of the music that you start to realize Dismas changed a bit. And I think a lot of that might have to do with the fact that Craig himself is playing a lot of the guitar on this album. You see, in addition to all his other projects, Craig also had sort of a weird post-metal thing going on with a band called Methadrone. And he mixes just enough of that into the weird, more autopsy-sounding section to lend sort of a psychedelic edge to the heaviness without losing that death metal atmosphere. It'd be interesting to see where this direction takes them if and when they get another full-length album out. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Blasphirian, who, as previously stated, appear to be pretty much done after the main guy died. But you still got all that old Blasphirian to check out, and you should definitely keep an eye on Dizma if you're into that sort of death metal stuff with, I mean, you, sh you sh should be, dude. It's fucking death metal. It's good for you. Yeah, buddy. Hopefully you enjoyed learning about those bands there. Appreciate you listening or watching whatever you did, and I'll see you year next time. Fuck the haters, sickos and trolls and that's coming from me. Yeah,